We're very excited to have you with us today for this core conversation on health and all policies, strengthening the equity pillar. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the co-facilitators of the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, or CORE, and I'm joined today by Nicole Young. He's waving in your screen there. And our guest today, Dr. Tiffany Wise West, who's the Sustainability and Climate Action Manager for the City of Santa Cruz. Dr. Rebecca Hernandez, the Director of the American Indian Resource Center at UCSC. Tiffany and Dr. Hernandez will be co-presenting portions of today's core conversation. So we wanna thank Beatrice Ortega, a member of our core team who's providing simultaneous interpretation today. I'd like to invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat. So let us know your name, your organization, and something you hope to learn today. And before we do that, in case you were not here earlier to hear the explanation, I'm just gonna go quickly through some of the explanations that we had before about how to use some of the tools in Zoom. So the main thing is that you can choose a language channel the, by clicking the interpretation globe and then mute original audio. And that allows you to listen to today's presentation with a live interpretation in Spanish. We're also asking everyone to rename themselves. You can do this by going to your photo tile, clicking in the upper right hand corner and then choosing the rename option that you see highlighted here. Then we ask you to add ENG for English, ESP for Spanish, and BIL for bilingual, so we can see who's listening in each mode. I'll turn this over to Tiffany Wise West now to help us do an accessibility check. All right, thank you so much, Nicole. It is lovely uh, to be with everyone today and I look forward to um, everything that we are going to talk about. So in terms of the accessibility check, this is really space um, for us to address any accessibility needs that might uh, occur right now for any of you as participants. Um, this is very important to do, ideally at the beginning of a meeting or even in your reminder message to make sure we're paying attention to what's needed for people to fully participate in this type of uh, an engagement. Um, some of the things that we can do um, is, for example, utilize the closed captioning or live translation, uh, I'm sorry, live uh, transcript uh, that is a feature that Zoom uh, has. And so um, in order to enable closed captioning, you can go to your menu bar in Zoom at the bottom of the screen, and you should find to the right of the record button, a CC button that says live transcript that will um, go ahead and uh, uh, activate your captions. So if that is something, if you have um, uh, audio uh, issues potentially um, or noise in your background, this might be a good way um, for you to follow the conversation. Um, also, we want you to make sure that you are able to stand up and take a stretch, step out if you need to for a bio break. Please, this is all about taking care of your needs, or maybe you have to have your camera off because you're tending to children while you're working. Um, you might, for example, hear dogs barking in my background, so I'm going to really try to keep muted um, as much as possible. Um, if you do need um, any other assistance that I haven't mentioned, the translation um, has already been uh, described as to how to access that. You can, uh, if you do need assistance, please send a private chat to Nicole Lezen. Uh, she is attending to accessibility needs in English. And for those in Spanish, please reach out with a private chat to Gisela Car Carrasco. Um, and again, uh, that will be in Spanish. 
Okay, so from there then, um, we want to move on to one other um, area that is uh, important, and that is res with respect to gender pronouns. Um, if you're comfortable, we do encourage you to please add your gender pronouns to your screen name. And, you know, uh, however, we don't, you know, that's up to you uh, it, it, with your comfort level. Um, you can see that our team is modeled um, on the screen um, it, by, they have renamed themselves to include uh, gender pronouns. For example, you can see after my name, she, her. And if you would like to do that, you can rename yourself by hovering on your picture um, in Zoom, clicking on the three dots, and then clicking rename. Um, again, this is all about not making assumptions about how people identify. And instead, let's normalize the use of these practices um, so that um, we are properly referencing people the way that they uh, identify. The last thing on this that I want to say is that you know, many of us have been taught to use singular pronouns for one person, for example, she or he, and plural pronouns for more than one person, for example, they or them. And so out of habit, our brains default to what we've been taught in the past. Um, but going forward, um, and I think we can go to the new, next slide, please, on this. Um, we do have some resources also, um, is that, uh, you know, also, our, our, again, our brains might default to what we've been taught, but that Spanish um, also is a gendered language and pronouns and words for people and things are masculine or feminine. And there really isn't consensus around what the new rules should be in any language. So that means it becomes even more important that we make it a habit to provide the opportunity for people to share their gender pronouns and train our brains to use them. And you can see, I'm sorry, I did say next slide, but I didn't mean it. Um, these additional resources are at the bottom of this of the uh, slide that you can also reference. I'm going to pass it back to um, Nicole uh, Lezen for an overview of CORE now. Thanks, Tiffany. I'm so conditioned to hearing next slide and immediately clicking, so <laughs> gave me good practice. So as I mentioned earlier, Nicole Young and I are here representing the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, or CORE. And if you're not familiar with CORE, it's a model that emerged from the county and city of Santa Cruz a few years ago to fund nonprofits that are providing safety net services in our area. Over the last few years, it's evolved from, from being a funding model to something broader, a movement to achieve equitable health and well being for everyone across the lifespan in our county. The evolution of CORE has been fueled by input and insights from many of you, partners in local government, philanthropy, nonprofits, and community groups. And that collaborative process has yielded the mission and vision that you see here with equity at the center. When we say equitable health and well being, we mean that everyone, across the lifespan has equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well-being that we hope are at this point quite familiar to many of you. We really mean that people's opportunities and life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by their race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or any other social identity. As both a funding model and movement, CORE is a framework that aligns priorities, programs, policies, funding, and results around community-wide goals and impacts so that we can all work together to create the core conditions for health and well-being. Equity is at the center of this diagram to illustrate that we have to examine and address our individual organizational and systemic beliefs, practices, and structures because these are the things that perpetuate the inequities that we're determined to eliminate. And events like this core coffee conversation are offered under the umbrella of the core institute for innovation and impact core institute is a relatively new name for the way we've been offering a variety of learning opportunities for people in nonprofits public sector grassroots groups and eventually we hope to include other sectors like the business community to build this shared vision and our common goals and to help develop the skills and capacity that increase our ability to work together to make our community a safe, healthy, 
and vibrant place for all of us. So today we're going to get to see a lot of the things I just described about the core conditions and equitable health and well-being with a particular framework and application from the city of Santa Cruz, and that's health in all policies. This, when the city adopted this, we learned about it through a, a previous core chat in July. So you may have attended that conversation where we had an overview from Tiffany and Martine and others about the health aspects of health in all policies. But today we'll get to hear more about it from our guests. And we look forward to that very much. And we'll get to not only hear about it, but also explore some of the elements of it through some practice elements in today's conversation, like looking more carefully at power dynamics before we close out. So I'll turn it back to Tiffany. We have a special way to move into this discussion and she's gonna share that and introduce our next speaker. But before I do that, let me do a quick overview of some guidance for a brave and inclusive space in our time together, especially for talking about issues like equity and power dynamics and the policies that either impede them or support them. So in our conversation today, while we'll be hearing some lectures from presenters, we also hope to have some interaction in this large group when you ask questions of each other and in some small pairings for breakout sessions later on. And regardless of how we're participating today, we hope that everyone can abide by these and think about how they apply to our interactions today. So sharing the air just means giving each other air time so that it's not dominated by any single person or group. And then of course, leaning into discomfort and taking some risks within the parameters of these conversations, because without leaning into some discomfort, we don't usually make much progress. We also encourage everyone to speak from your own experience instead of making assumptions about others, trying to listen as fully and being as present as is humanly possible for you this afternoon. We know many of you are in Zoom meetings before and after this one. It's a long time to be paying attention and being wedded to a screen, but we, um, we hope that you can really um, focus your energy and your attention today with the speakers and with each other. It's really important to be curious and in, in approach all of these topics with a spirit of curiosity. And we refer to that as calling in instead of calling out and trying to separate people's intent from the impact of their words or actions. We want to honor confidentiality in our discussions today and practice self-care. If something is triggering or difficult for you, take a moment off from the screen and the conversation and come back when you're ready. And we'd like to thank Hannah Garcia, who's worked with CORE and many, uh, many other organizations in Santa Cruz County and throughout the region as a cultural equity consultant for bringing these great practices to our work. Tiffany? Okay, thank you, Nicole. Before we move on to an overview of what the city's health and all policies work has looked like over this first year of implementation, there's really one other important best practice that overview that we're gonna make some time for this afternoon. And that is because our meeting today, our, our conversation uh, is being held on native land while all of us are in different areas likely of Santa Cruz, maybe in other parts of the state, um, that is the case. And so I would like to introduce Dr. Rebecca Hernandez, who will be um, discussing what a land or territory acknowledgement is, why it is important to do, and how to keep it meaningful and authentic. Dr. Hernandez is the director of American Indian of the American Indian Resource Center, where her work is focused on the retention of Native students and developing programs that promote a better understanding of American Indian cultures and life ways at the university. Working in higher ed for the past 15 years, she has taught courses uh, in universities and community colleges, and her app academic expertise is in American studies with a concentration in Native American studies. She conducts workshops and presentations on a wide variety of top topics, including land acknowledgements, American Indians in the US, American Indian art and tribal governance. Her local community service includes serving on the board of the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History and as a commissioner on Santa Cruz County Latino Affairs. Dr. Hernandez, I turn this over to you. Okay, Thank great. you for 
Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, as Tiffany mentioned, my name is Rebecca Hernandez and I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director of the American Indian Resource Center at UC Santa Cruz, where I work with native students. And my own tribe, uh, I'm Mescalero in Warm Springs Apache. My uh, family originally came from this, the state of New Mexico and our reservation is in the Southwest part of that state. Um, so today I'm here to talk with you about land acknowledgements and we can go on to the next slide. Next slide, there's beautiful Santa Cruz. So I get asked this question a lot, right? What is the correct term to use when you're referring to someone American Indian? And um, these are all terms that are 100% uh, you know, okay to use, uh, American Indian. I know sometimes people feel uncomfortable or they're not sure is American Indian still okay to use. Uh, it absolutely is. The name of the center that I run is American Indian Resource Center. So never hesitate to use that term, uh, Native American, Native on its own, First Americans, uh, up in Alaska, folks refer to themselves as Alaska Native, in Canada, First Nations, and, and Indigenous for anyone who's Indigenous to the land anywhere in the world. So you're never going to make a mistake calling someone Indigenous, right? That's Native. Um, however, the best practice would be to refer to the specific tribe of the person or group that you're addressing. So um, now that you know I'm Mescalero in Warm Springs Apache, you can, in, you know, in the future, if you were to introduce me to somebody, that would be the best way to honor who I am by acknowledging that you appreciate I am that particular tribe. In the United States, there are 574 federally recognized tribes. And what that means is those tribes have a government to government relationship with the United States. They hold a treaty uh, with the US and typically they uh, have what, what they call land base or reservation land. And that just means land reserved for them. Uh, reservations are many different sizes and all over the country. Um, there are also hundreds of state recognized tribes in the United States, such as the Amamutsan Tribal Band, whose traditional homelands I'm speaking from today. So what is a land acknowledgement? Um, this is an important question uh, to ask because, you know, there's uh, a lot of confusion about what they are and why they get done. So that's why we're going to talk about it today. But a land acknowledgement simply means that you're recognizing the history and the presence of Indigenous people uh, that were, um, that called that land home and their enduring relationship to that homeland. So land acknowledgements help create awareness about the cultural erasure of indigenous people and the processes of colonization and subjugation that have contributed to our erasure, right? So the land acknowledgement shared in this presentation was developed by the Amamutsan Tribal Band, Chairman Valentin Lopez and the Amamutsan Relearning Program at the UCSC Arboretum. From the Native perspective, all Natives, all non-Natives, pardon me, are guests on this land. And to further uh, drive the point home, I'm a visitor on this land because I am not Amamutsan. Okay, so anyone who is not native to a particular place is a guest. And when you go to someone's home, right, there's a way in which you should engage with that space. And that's why we talk about it this way, that we should be respectful, that we should remember whose homeland we're in, that we should engage in particular ways. So for native folks, living somewhere other than our traditional homelands makes us visitors there as well, as I mentioned. The indigenous people of the land are the stewards and direct descendants of that land, and we hold that ancestral and genetic blood memory to the place. So knowledge of enriching philosophies of the land-based skills and belief systems that are intrinsic to that place and will help that will help future generations depend, that future generations will depend upon, 
regardless of cultural lineage. So land acknowledgements help us remember that fact. Next slide. So another question that gets asked is, you know, do all Native people think land acknowledgements are should be practiced? Does every Native person feel the same way about them? Absolutely not. Okay, <laughs> but um, that is the case with anything, right? You're never going to have absolute consensus on anything. However, one of the criticisms of practicing land acknowledgments stems from the fact that um, they can become just another thing you have to do, right? Another box to check, another practice that you have to be sure you do. So everybody, you know, all the, all of your obligations are met. But um, you know, in this particular quote, it's about higher ed, right? Higher education. And that's where I work. And so it's a, it is true, right? There are, um, there are practices that just become kind of a, a rote practice or meaningless practice. And um, this particular scholar believes, right, that it's just a way to show others that you have a particular um, Right, land acknowledgements don't challenge us to reconsider beliefs or to learn new things. They simply signal that the speaker, right, is faithful to an ethical system that audience members presumably share. So that's a pretty hard hitting comment there, but it's also one that I think is important to keep in mind as you consider land acknowledgements in your own personal practice at where you work. Next slide. So how should they be done, right? Number one word, respectfully, okay? You get up, you introduce yourself, and before you read the acknowledgement, practice the pronunciations of the tribes. And I cannot say this to you enough, if you do not know the name of the tribe or how to say it, don't do it. It is far more disrespectful for you to get up and say, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly. I don't know exactly how to say this. No, then you didn't do the work. Don't read the acknowledgement, okay? And there are plenty of places that you can go to to get the phonetic spellings of the tribes. And I'm more than happy to help you find them if you don't know where they are. Get comfortable with saying the names take time to read it. Okay, don't stand there. Okay, the land we stand on right now, right? Like super fat, just get it over. No, take your time, pace yourself. At the end, take a few moments to conclude. And again, remember that you're practicing allyship when you read the acknowledgement, right? And you're setting an example for others. So show them how important it is. Okay, next. Please follow the script. This is another thing that I see often happens, right? People just decide to write their own land acknowledgement. No, <laughs> right? Tribes, write the acknowledgement, you read it. That's how it works. So do not write your own land acknowledgement or add additional text to the official acknowledgement, which also gets done, right? Do not perform a ceremony, do not burn sage, do not, you know, none of that. It's not a ritual before or after the reading of the acknowledgement. Simply do what I suggested, right? Go up and read it. Okay. What should people do while a land acknowledgement is being read? And this is something else to consider because when I go places and people are reading land acknowledgements, I see folks on their phone. I see folks typing on their laptop, folks talking to their buddy, right? No, take a moment, right? We're always so consumed with doing something every moment. This is a moment to sit, quietly focus on the speaker, take a moment to reflect, and to think about the beautiful land that surrounds you. I mean, we're all here in Santa Cruz County. It's one of the most beautiful places on earth, right? So we have a lot to be grateful for, a lot to reflect on, and taking two minutes of a meeting, it's time to do that, is really important. So just be respectful as someone's reading it. Okay. This is the Amamutsun Tribal Band Land Acknowledgement. So um, it reads, the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswa-speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsun Tribal Band 
comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast, is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. That's the perfect way, you know, that's about the perfect pace, the way I just read it. And that's their uh, emblem down at the bottom. The hummingbird is, their, is one of the sacred animals to the Yamamutsan people. Next. Should land acknowledgements be done at every event we host or at every meeting? Another common question, answer is no, okay? Land acknowledgements should be done when you decide as a leader or a convener that you'd like it to be shared. There are no rules about how often or when. Rather than read it, some people opt to have a slide with the acknowledgement on it while people are arriving at an event um, or on their meeting agendas. Some folks ask uh, a different staff member to read it before each meeting. That's another way you could do it. However, you should, as the organizer of an event, be prepared to answer as to why you did or did not read it, okay? These are other ways that you can acknowledge the Yamamutsan tribal band um, and the land when speaking. So if you don't have time to read the whole acknowledgement, that's fine. Or if you feel like, you know, it isn't appropriate for whatever you're doing, you can simply say, as I said earlier, right, I am speaking today from Santa Cruz, California, the traditional homelands of the Amamutsan tribal band. Or City Hall is located on the unceded territory of the Amamutsan tribal band. That is 100% sufficient. So uh, this next slide is for is question time. And I do want to say, I mentioned that I'm Warm Springs and Mescalero Apache, and this is a photo of my homeland. Um, this is our sacred mountain. This is Sierra Blanca. It's not the name we call it, but it's the name it's been given. And, um, and this is what it looks like about this time of year. We get lots of snow there, and it's a beautiful place, and I miss it very much. Haven't been able to get home for over a year. So, um, so I hope there's some questions since we've got about seven minutes left uh, for that. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez. If anyone has a question, please feel free to raise your hand using the reaction buttons or just unmute yourself and jump in. Or you can pose a question in the chat and we'll monitor those as well. Adrian, I see your hand up, go ahead. Thank you so much. This has um, been very valuable. And um, so one question I have is when there are multiple tribes, did you, did I miss it? I'm sorry. No. <laughs> yeah. What, what about when there are multiple tribes, like in the, if you're wanting to acknowledge a region or do we just want to acknowledge where I stand? So question there regarding that space. Okay. So you're giving an example of you are at a place where multiple tribes claim that as their territory? Right. Well, in Santa Cruz, for example, where we have more than just um, the tribe you just described. Amamutsen? Yeah, right. They're like we, anyway, I'm, I can't remember their names, of course, when I want to. Um, but when, if it's a region we're wanting to acknowledge, so like Santa Cruz has multiple tribes. Santa Cruz does not have multiple tribes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Santa Cruz has one tribe and that's the Amamutsen. Um, however, in the bay, in Monterey Bay, which is a, a, a large swath of land, right? There were many bands. And so um, you can say, uh, we are, you know, on the traditional homelands of California natives. Okay. Done. Okay. It, it, that helps you avoid complications if folks feel like, you know, you're acknowledging one over the other. If you're in Santa Cruz, the city, or even in the outskirts, all the way to Aptos, all the way to Watsonville, all, I mean, really, it's safe to say the Yamamutsen in, okay. this, in this particular county, um, because that's what I've been taught. But, um, and that's what I understand to be correct. Okay, thank you very much for that. Sure. Are there other questions? 
Yes. Hi, Rebecca. Um, yes, um, the Ohlone. So this is a great, this is a really great question. Um, so Ohlone is like an umbrella term for uh, tribes that were in the Bay Area and parts of Northern California. So, um, but mostly along the coast. And so saying Ohlone is not incorrect. Just like saying Rebecca Hernandez is Apache. That is correct. But more specifically, I'm Mescalero and Warm Springs Apache, right? So Apache is an umbrella term and my tribes give more information about who I am because there are seven Apache tribes in the United States. So that's a good thing, right? To, to again, keep working down to what tribes the person are. So, um, or is. So the, the um, you will not, you do not make a mistake by using the term Ohlone. Um, you can use that term and then you're most definitely going to cover a lot of ground there, right? Um, Nicole just included a really great uh, link that you can go to if you want to get super specific about exactly where you're going to be and that it will tell you. But um, I also think it's important important just to recognize that um, if you can find the name of the tribe, that's, that's really the best practice. But you will not make a mistake saying Maloney either. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? It looks like there's a question, but in the chat. So I see someone asking about the site that Nicole Young posted. Is that site also where the land acknowledgements are found? No, you can find the land acknowledgement by going to, um, to our website and um, just clicking on the, um, the land acknowledgement link. And I'm putting our center's name in there. Someone asked a question in Spanish. Was that, did it get translated? I, I think that's a translation of the, the question. question. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. So, um, so that's the link to our center. And we have a lot of information on that site, just tons. We've got K through 12 resources for teachers. We've got all kinds of great stuff on there, but certainly you can see the land acknowledgement and we even provide the phonetic uh, pronunciations of the tribes. And please reach out to me also. I'll put my email address in here um, because I love to hear from community folks. And if you have questions about anything I didn't cover here or you want to further discuss this with me, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm always really happy to be in touch. So two minutes left. Anybody else have a question? Well, I, um, okay. Um, no. So the question is, would I suggest organizations acknowledge native tribes that are not indigenous to this specific region? I'm not sure what the context is, why you would um, do that, but no. The whole point of a land acknowledgement is to recognize the people of that particular place, wherever you are at that moment. Um, so I want to say to all of you, it is such an honor for me to be here because um, I can't say enough about how important it is to us that people understand land acknowledgements and really do their best to practice it when they can. And, um, you know, there's uh, at, at the university where I work, there's less than 1% of the students are American Indian. And so it can feel very lonely for us, you know. And so just the fact that you would um, do this and practice it means so much to us. Uh, we are really grateful and, and appreciative of the opportunity to share with you. Thank you. And we are so grateful to you. I'm, I'm sure you have, by sharing that practice today, have have spread it even more widely to every corner of our county. So thank you. Thanks. Okay. Well, have a, have a great rest of the uh, conversation today. And again, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. And thanks for sharing your contact information for both the organization and you personally. I'm sure you'll be hearing from, sure. from many of us. Thank you.
Okay, so now we'll turn to the topic of how the city of Santa Cruz is centering equity. And to guide us through that and to introduce this topic, we have Martine Watkins. Tiffany, would you like to introduce Martine? Sure, just very quickly, I would like to introduce our former mayor and current city council member, Martine Watkins, who was really the driving force and continues to be the champion for health and all policies. And she's gonna say a few introductory words before I share a bit more about what the city's been doing. Martine, can I turn it over to you, please? Absolutely, thank you so much, um, Tiffany. And thank you so much, Dr. Hernandez for your presentation, that was wonderful. Um, I won't take long, cause I know we really want to dive deeply into what health and all policies looks like with a focus on equity. But I'll just briefly kick it off with sort of a personal, um, you know, acknowledgement of how I, it came into my world. And my brother who works in public health shared with me this framework that really rang true to me, which is essentially saying, how can we at all levels of government as decision makers start to think about equity, public health and sustainability in the decisions that we make? And he uh, shared this, this framework that was created with me um, that already existed. And so uh, motivated to really accomplish what health and all policies seeks to do. And as former mayor, I was able to work with Tiffany and other members of our city team to how to identify this framework and to really look at how we can use it in our decision making in a way that would impact community well being. And what we did was we had a listening tour and we heard from community and we came up with ways to oper operationalize our strategies. Um, and a few things that came to be true. One is that this approach, which Health and All Policies wholeheartedly acknowledges, um, really allows everyone working in government to identify ways to work together to tackle some of the biggest challenges we face. And it's needed because what we recognize is that no single um, agency or office or entity alone can solve a lot of these complex interconnected problems that we face. It also believes um, in the power of government to really impact and influence community change. And it's an iterative process, but can be used as a vehicle to produce government efficiencies and really find ways to find um, co-benefits and ways to generate co-benefits for multiple partners and agencies. Um, what we know is that health and all policies really acknowledges that every aspect of our community affects the health and well-being and every type of decision we make. Um, and last but not least, it really is related to how we as policymakers and how this framework could help guide us as policymakers and decision makers can improve outcomes in community health and well-being and equity. And so at this point, um, I will pass it on to Dr. Tiffany Wise West, who I feel really grateful to have uh, at the city, who has really just taken this on in such a meaningful way. Uh, we continue to learn ways to even grow it further, to further refine it, and ultimately to um, embed more voices into it. So at this point, I'll go ahead and hand it back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Martine, and thank you for continuing to be a champion. I apologize, my mailman's here and my dog's barking, so I'll just do the best I can here. I apologize for that. Um, I just... I just want to point out in this slide some of the key facets of health and all, po health and all policies um, that Martine already articulated, which really is all around, you know, intersectoral collaboration, um, get, getting to the systemic root causes um, of issues and making process and structural change and really engaging across stakeholders. So I just, I, re I really want to emphasize those things. Um, also want to give you a, a kind of a little more on the on the background. Um, so uh, Martine and, and the rest of the team began looking at this approach um, in 2019. City Council um, adopted policy uh, in late 2019. And then in early 2020, about a year ago, we adopted the Health and All Policies Year One Implementation Work Plan. And we have spent 2020 implementing that work plan, as I will share with you in just a moment. Um, really, this framework that I'm showing here merges very well with the next slide, please. 
um, which uh, really is um, this making equity real framework. So health and all policies is kind of that overarching framework and lens that we're using um, to look at trying to normalize every facet of our operations and our decision making. But when it gets down to on the ground level, on the project or policy or programmatic level, we are really turning to this making equity real framework and, and to intentionally and meaningfully center equity in particular public health and climate resilience projects or really, again, any project program or decision. And program have begun to do so and then health and all policies this is beginning to permeate our organization so if there is just one thing that you take away from this presentation today it's really these four steps in which equity must be embedded throughout the process so the first is the goals and missions um, the goals values and mission you know, how is equity described in the context overall policy uh, project or plan? Is it missing? Is equity a core component? And I'm not going to read all of these questions, but the second step is process. The third step is implementation. And the fourth step is analysis and measurement with even the thought to next steps around adapting and scaling rep and replicating. So if we're thinking even beyond a specific project or a policy. Our theory is that equity has to show up in all four categories to have the strongest outcomes for communities. And we have to be intentional and explicit in that. Um, the concern is that when policies, programs, projects, investments are developed and implemented without intentional consideration of equity, um, racial equities are likely to be forgotten or reinforced and in some instances exacerbated, certainly something that we want um, to avoid. Um, so what I'd like to do is, um, let's go on to the next slide, please, is I want, I would like to run through the, the making equity real, the four important steps in the context of both health and all policies itself and how it was developed and our interim recovery plan, which was just adopted in November and the implementation plan went to city council and was uh, approved uh, in late February. So um, with respect to the first step, it's really all about goals. And with respect um, to health and all policies, um, there are five implementation objectives um, that support um, a number of um, uh, goals that I'll be sharing in just a moment. There are eight implementation actions that were called out to achieve those objectives. Um, and then we also were explicit that our goal, we really wanted this effort to be data driven and outcomes to be measurable. And to that end, we have 19 process and impact evaluation metrics to assess those actions, as well as um, an outcome evaluation metrics um, framework that is in progress. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So the three goals of the Health and All Policies Year One Implementation Work Plan then were as listed here, really to uh, promote a local government culture that prioritizes community well-being and equity through the three pillars of health and all policies um, to integrate these three tenets of health and all policies into local government agency practices. So again, the structures, the process, and to provide a forum for agencies to identify shared goals and opportunity to enhance community well-being performance through collaboration. So you can see the um, the five elements of health and all policies really um, coming out in the goals um, for health and all policies. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, another piece that was has been very important that we realized early on in terms of the process is really having shared uh, understanding of definitions and specifically, and you know, we, we found this through some internal um, employee surveying that we did 
Um, but I just kind of want to review for all of us to have a common understanding what some of these terms do mean. And I know that this may be a repeat of something you've seen before, but maybe you hear it in a different way that resonates with you. So in terms of diversity of peoples and perspectives, you know, we're really talking about about quantity, how uh, what, how many different uh, peoples and, and uh, backgrounds can we bring into the conversation? And there are so many ways, examples in the local government level, whether it's the acknowledgement of holidays of all cultures, or ensuring that our recruitment of commissioners and task force members are have diverse uh, diversity in them. Um, those are just think about this. Um, you know, how can we make it easier for them to participate? For example, offering childcare or dinner or transportation funding. Um, in terms of inclusion, this is where quality comes in, that really creating authentic opportunities for diverse voices to be part of the conversation. Really here, this is being aware of our unconscious or implicit biases, um, and to really throughout our organization, communicate the importance of managing bias personally and within our work groups. Um, and so again, making it easy for people to participate and communicate and report back and know that it is valued is super important. Um, and then in terms of equity itself, um, this results from policies or practices and ways of working together and really here outcomes is the key. Um, you know, how, how, what do our community well-being indicators look like? Are we making progress in a data-driven kind of way? And I think it's really important here um, and we've, you know, learned this firsthand to acknowledge that this equity work is an ongoing and iterative process um, where we may take bold risks that sometimes fail and that we need to um, reflect on that and improve on that. Um, and that's part of the process. So let's go ahead and go to next slide. The next slide, please. Also on the topic of, of definitions, the city itself actually adopted in its ordinance um, definitions for all of these different terms and so that we could have a basis of reference for uh, or a starting point per se for our, our employees and, and staff as to um, where we uh, the common definitions that we all are starting from. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please which is on implementation. So this is the third uh, step in the uh, making equity real uh, process. And when we're looking at health and all policies and it's year one implementation, this is where the rubber hits the road. And so over 2020, I'm proud to report that we actually have achieved all five of our objectives and our actions as are listed here on the screen. And I'll go into a little bit of detail on these because this is, I think, what a lot of folks might be interested in is, okay, we've done this internal reflection. What is changing internally at the city? So first of all, um, something that city council adopted in their policy is that they wanted to see agenda reports, which any item that goes before our decision makers is accompanied by an agenda report that describes the background, um, the analysis or discussion and the fiscal impacts of whatever the item is, project policy going forward. Our health and all policies, um, city council policy requires that agenda report preparers actually include language as to how sustainability, public health and equity were integrated and considered in the item itself. The goal there is to remind our council members of these overarching tenants that we are working towards in our governance um, and to have more robust conversation around those considerations. And um, we have just launched a guidance document for staff as well as um, we have a half hour training video and we're giving a number of live um, trainings with respect to this particular item, which I think um, will be, uh, has the potential to be transformational. So you'll find that language in the analysis section of the agenda report. We also, and I'm going to share this with you in a moment um, on the monitoring piece, it, um, we also uh, will be bringing our year one implementation evaluation report uh, to satisfy our annual uh, report. Uh, reporting requirement. Um, 
to City Council uh, actually in April. And so we will be reporting on all of our process and impact metrics, as well as um, our uh, community well-being outcomes uh, indicator metrics. And that's the framework for measurement and reporting that I'll be sharing with you in just a moment. We've also conducted uh, training uh, for our employees in the health and all policies uh, pillars. We've actually had over 200 employees participate in some enhanced diversity, equity, and inclusion training um, and had some um, some topically specific and, and group specific uh, trainings. Um, and lastly, we have uh, participated in, uh, this is now actually the third stakeholder and partner convening to sector collaboration and with the first being our July core coffee chat, our second being a regional sustainability and equity convening, and then the third being uh, this. So um, you will see more details in April uh, with the report that's going to city council along with our years two to five work plan, uh, which is in development. Next slide, please. Lastly, uh, well, not quite lastly, um, on the analysis and measurement phase uh, or stage rather, um, as I mentioned, uh, we are bringing forward to city council uh, also with the year one um, implementation report, these proposed community well-being indicators, and this is just one of several pages. Um, as you can see, we have aligned our community well-being indicators with the core conditions for health and well-being. Nicole um, introduced uh, the core conditions, and if you've been on this call before, you're familiar with what that is, and select core community indicators. Um, so you can see that in one of the middle columns. We also have the starting point uh, on a city, uh, city basis and where that's not available on the county basis for us to reference as staff are preparing agenda reports as we're preparing equity data narratives for specific initiatives. Um, so again, look for this uh, in our next uh, in the April uh, City Council meeting where this is coming forward. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and then just to uh, round things out on the adapt and scale, which I, I mentioned is kind of the, the next step here. Um, we are uh, trying to be bold in a time of crisis with health and all policies. As I mentioned, we have this year two to five implementation work plan, which is being informed um, by uh, a number of different things, notably, uh, recently a, uh, a city leadership workshop on this making, making equity real uh, framework. Um, we also were, will be developing uh, the community engagement plan to go along with that. And I should say as a result of this, the city is really acknowledging that um, approaching relationship building and capacity building irrespective of on a project basis is very valuable uh, thing for us to do and that we need to shift to that and uh, we are looking at how to do so um, uh, through the interim recovery plan and the health and all policies year two to five work plan. We are also reinforcing this commitment to health and all policies through the intentional intersection with our interim recovery plan which is looking out 18 minutes I'm sorry, 18 months, um, and uh, has quite a bit in there um, uh, focused on equity and of course sustainability and in some cases public health. Our climate action plan project has just launched um, and there we have an equity uh, consultant um, and we will have an equity working group for the duration of that project also um, for folks that will be a compensated role. Um, to not only embed equity in the overall, but through every step in the process. Um, lastly, we will continue to promote health and all policies partner with partners at all scales. We've given um, talks with the National Association of City uh, Health Organizations, um, as well as you know organizations, small organizations here in Santa Cruz. So really committed to that um, collaboration, that dialogue, that relationship building. Um, that is the key here that I want to end on is that 
One thing that I think we as local government struggle with is that, you know, the timeline of our grant projects, the timeline of our infrastructure projects, they don't necessarily go at the pace of relationship and trust building. And so that is a paradigm shift that I think that we are slowly making here. Um, and as I said, there uh, will be stuff coming out of the city manager's office related to what that might look like over this next year. Um, with that, I think that is the end of my example of how we utilize this making it real uh, equity framework, making equity real framework in health and all policies and how it's been reinforced in some of our planning. So I'm gonna turn it um, over to Nicole for the uh, exploring uh, power Although I think before we that we have one kind of a fun little clean energy stretch here. So I just want to confirm with the Nicole's that we're ready for that. Yes. And before, maybe before we do the clean energy stretch, Tiffany, I see at least one question in the chat. Uh, are the trainers and consultants people of color, especially women and LGBTQI folks? Yes. Um, our consultant that um, has been helping us, in addition to uh, both Nicole Lezen and Nicole Young, uh, is the Green Lining Institute in Oakland, and you can check them out. They do work um, at the intersection of climate and equity, and yes, our uh, facilitators, aside from myself, were all uh, people of color uh, and women, incidentally. Um, and uh, we continue to work with them uh, on these projects. Um, so more to come on, you know, additional opportunities to work with other groups um, as we develop this year two to five work plan. Thank you, Tiffany. And I also want to point out that Nicole Young has been posting some resources in the chat. So you might be able to learn more about both Race Matters Institute and, and other resources in the chat. So Tiffany, I'm going to stop my screen share and turn it over to you for our clean energy break. Okay, everyone, I hope I, I would like you to get ready for this clean energy stretch. It's really easy and it only takes one minute and you're going to feel great afterwards. So we're going to start by taking a deep breath and drawing on that energy that you get from food from our earth. And then from there, you're gonna reach up to some solar energy and get some warm solar energy up here, get those arms up there. And then we're gonna reach down to the floor and we're gonna tap the floor and tap into some geothermal energy. Get, get that geothermal and you're gonna come back up and then we're gonna rotate our arms like a wind turbine. Get us some of that wind energy and the other way just to make it even. And one more thing with our arms, we're going to do run of the river hydropower. We're swimming down the river, swimming on down. Here you go. And give yourself a big hand because that is the clean energy stretch. Nice, nicely done, everyone. That's awesome and such efficient energy, too. <laughs> All right, back to you, Nicole Young. I, uh, that was awesome. That was the second time I've um, seen Tiffany do that. I'm just like, <laughs> not only does it bring a smile to my face, but it uh, just brings much needed energy. So thank you for that, Tiffany. Um, and I would encourage everyone, because I know that this is you know, a longer session. If you want to keep doing those stretches or you need to stand up uh, and move around, feel free to do that. Um, because we, you, you have noticed, we did not build in more of a break other than that. Um, and hopefully you've also noticed too through this session that, you know, we wanted to really build in opportunities to learn by doing in our first part, our first segment of this session. It was, you know, a good learning experience for all of us. And just a good reminder about um, some of the, even if they seem really small, um, there are also really important ways to um, create inclusive environments, which is an important part of getting to equity by making sure that, um, you know, our meetings, our trainings, our materials, our communication is accessible, not only in terms of language, um, but for those that might have uh, vision or hearing impairments, or again, even just acknowledging um, whose land we're on. I know that that uh, for several of you, I could see in the chats what was a really meaningful and helpful learning experience. And so 
these are all things that we're also trying to learn and practice and, and build into our work as part of core as well so we're really pleased to be learning along with everybody else um and you know in terms of the the work that the city of santa cruz is doing around health and all policies you know i think the thing that stands out for me when i when i hear martine and tiffany talking about this when i see some of the work that they're doing when i think about some of the other efforts that i know are going on around our county you know, I think for me, it's just a helpful, really helpful reminder that this is um, not a one and done kind of deal, right? That this is a long term commitment. Change happens um, slowly, oftentimes. It happens, you know, at the pace of trust and relationships that Tiffany was talking about. And, you know, in our, in Nicole's and my work around CORE, and, and many of you know this because you've um, been in many discussions with us about equity, you know, and, and, and what it means in core, you know, it's, it's really important to us to, to find ways to keep it authentic. Um, you know, Tiffany talked about doing things with intention and being explicit. Um, so those are things that, um, you know, again, we hope to learn and practice together as well. Uh, so this next segment is really a chance for us to do some individual reflection, but also hopefully share that with each other so that we're continuously kind of challenging and pushing each other to make equity real. Um, you know, I know I've been part of conversations before with some of you uh, in this meeting today about, you know, how easy it can be for equity to become just kind of the latest buzzword, right? We've kind of learned the vocabulary, we've learned kind of how to say the right words, um, you know, so when we, you know, kind of pepper our, our conversations with, you know, equity, equity for all and disparities and equitable and, you know, and I, and I include myself in this also, right? Every, sometimes it can turn into like every other word is equity. Um, and when we really stop and think about it, we kind of have to ask ourselves like, well, what do we really mean by that? And, and do we all have a shared understanding of what that means? You know, equity is both a process as well as the results that we're aiming for because um, it's, you know, it can be really easy to convince ourselves that we are <clears throat> like doing equity if we do things like, you know, put the word equity in our documents or we disaggregate data, you know, break it down and look at it in different ways by race and ethnicity and income and gender. And, and those are all really important steps to take. But if we stop there or, um, you know, that's the only thing that we do, or we do those things in isolation, um, then we really aren't creating the kinds of structural changes in our policies and our practices and our systems that are needed to uh, reverse these disparities, right? To create those equitable outcomes uh, in all those dimensions of health and well-being. So that's why we always, <clears throat> in our core events, emphasize, you know, the 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 interconnected, interdependent nature of these eight core conditions for health and well-being with equity at the center, that these are not only um, kind of basic human needs and things that each person needs throughout their lifespan to be healthy and thriving, but we can also think of these as the systems and sectors that also need to be interconnected, that are very interdependent, um, that the kinds of policies and practices that happen in one area around whether it's housing or education right, can have a ripple effect on opportunities and outcomes in other core conditions. So we always think about um, our work at the intersections. And when we think about, you know, what does it take to create transformational change then? How do we, how do we really make sure we're making equity real? How do we create transformational structural changes. Um, the health and all policies guidance document that, that Tiffany mentioned a moment ago has this great um, tool from Multnomah County in Oregon. It's their equity and empowerment lens. And it basically contains some um, kind of guiding questions to think through about people, place, process, and power for any given issue or decision that you're working on. And we can send out, I realize that it's, um, what you're seeing on the screen is small. <laughs> so we can send these out later. Also, if you're interested in, in taking a closer look at these, 
Um, but they, they're really helpful guiding questions to think through, like what is going to be the impact on people, on place? What kind of process uh, is needed to create equity and, and, and what is the balance of power? And even before trying to, or as part of, you know, trying to answer those questions, it can really be helpful to think about these two kind of underlying and again, very interconnected uh, issues here around building readiness for authentic community engagement and shared power. Um, that really those uh, are helpful to think about, not only what that looks like from a community's perspective, but an organization or a system's readiness to engage in authentic uh, relationships with community and to be ready to share power. And so we'll kind of explain this a little bit, a little bit more. This is a chart. This is just a, an excerpt from um, a tool or, or a document called um, the Spectrum of Engagement to Ownership. It's actually part of a fuller kind of document and guide. But we're just showing this spectrum here because you know I think it's a really helpful. This like I know for myself, I want to make this part of my regular kind of thinking process and kind of assessment of my own work and how I'm, you know, working with different groups and different communities and, and thinking about, um, you know, where, where on the spectrum um, are community engagement efforts falling. And in some ways, you know, it's, it's I think, helpful to, to say or acknowledge, like, not everything needs to fall on this, you know, far right um, end of the spectrum of collaborate and um, defer to. But what's really important is to make sure that, you know, the actions are in alignment with the intent, right? So if you are, hopefully we can all <laughs> agree that we're gonna try everything we possible to make sure we're not on this far left side of ignore and marginalizing communities where we're either intentionally or maybe unintentionally denying access to decision-making processes, right? That that's what we're trying to avoid or prevent. Um, you know, when I think about even some of my own work, right, that uh, in terms of kind of the intent to engage with the community, that oftentimes it looks more like something in the middle of the spectrum here, right? Maybe informing the community by providing relevant information or consulting with the community by gathering input or involving them by, you know, listening to voices or making sure that different voices are, are heard and, and integrated into a planning process. Um, those alone, you know, there may be certain situations where that really is the appropriate form of community engagement. Um, but just know that there's, there's always that risk of, you know, informing can just become placating the community and make them feel like they were <laughs> heard and engaged when really, uh, you know, maybe they weren't. Or that by consulting, it could uh, possibly become token, tokenization or tokenizing where um, you, you know, you might say, oh, well, we heard from the community, we got their input, but then you still kind of go and do what you were going to do anyway, right, behind closed doors. And so, you know, this is, I think, a, just a helpful tool to think about what do we really mean, what's really needed in this situation, and how do we, again, kind of continuously challenge ourselves and push ourselves to move more towards the far right end of the spectrum around collaborate, where we might delegate decision-making power um, or even defer to the community where they really own the decision from beginning to end. Um, because each one of those requires a different kind of mindset, a different process, a uh, different way of doing things. So that I think can be helpful to think about in terms of authentic community engagement. And then, you know, having some shared understandings and definitions of power, words like power and privilege can also be helpful because Probably because those can often be trigger words, like those might be the things that cause someone to freeze up or say, well, that's not me, or I didn't do that, or you misunderstand me. And so the more that we can uh, really acknowledge that these things exist and, and think about our role in and, and how we use these um, helps in creating that sense of, again, authentic community engagement. So I know that there are a lot of different definitions that exist out there about power and privilege. These two that we're showing on the screen here uh, actually come from, again, it's a, there's a full guide behind this. This is just a tiny excerpt um, called Fostering Equity, Creating Shared Understanding for Building Community Resilience, created by the Center for Community Resilience out of George Washington University, 
back east. And they've been doing some work here locally with our ACES, uh, ACES Aware um, learning sessions. So some of you may be familiar with that. This was actually a resource they shared with us in their last session they did with us. Um, and so I'm gonna just summarize how their guide defines power and privilege and have us think about that for this next exercise. So think of power as having access to resources that enhance your chance of getting what you need in order to lead a comfortable, productive, and safe life. Um, sometimes that might mean, you know, resources meaning money, maybe it's your social connections or your networks um, or relationships, or uh, it could be tangible, you know, resources, having your basic needs met. So think of resources in the broadest sense possible. Privilege being, um, that having that access to resources, and very often it's unearned, meaning you didn't have to do something to get those resources, right? So unearned access to resources that you have because of your social identity or group membership, meaning race, ethnicity, gender identity, um, income level, you know, all those kinds of dimensions of diversity um, that we often think about. So think about privilege as, you know, you belong to a certain social identity or, or social group, and that comes with certain privileges, which we often think of as that, you know, it means that, get, that you have an advantage or immunity or kind of like a protective buffer against uh, things like discrimination or um, prejudice because of that, again, social group that you belong to. And the, you know, the tricky thing about privilege is that it's, it's often invisible to those who have it. Um, that it's not something we have to, that's part of the nature of privilege is that we don't often don't see it and we don't have to recognize it uh, if we don't want to. And so I think it's also important to acknowledge that, um, you know, a person can have privilege based on certain aspects of their social identity and also still experience being what we call in the margins or being othered or being excluded based on other aspects of their social identity. So it's not a clear cut, like you either have it or you don't, <laughs> um, but there are many different, you know, dimensions and kind of nuances to things like power and privilege. So for example, um, someone might identify as white, so would have privilege based on race uh, or skin color, um, might also identify as a woman and could be experiencing both the privilege based on skin color and disadvantages in terms of um, feeling discriminated against based on gender stereotypes, for instance, or maybe someone who identifies as male and experiences uh, certain privileges based on that male identity, but also identifies as queer and feels like, it's, you know, maybe the work environment or family isn't a safe place to um, disclose that. Uh, and so again, can experience both privilege and uh, aspects or areas of, uh, of oppression. Um, another example, someone maybe that is an English speaking citizen. So again, experiences privilege there, uh, but may have a learning disability, for example, and maybe that disability is not readily visible or obvious, right? But that person feels like, again, either in a school environment or a work environment that they have to work twice or as hard, three times as hard just to keep up and to not feel like they're, you know, um, either, you know, a burden or <laughs> slowing other people down, right? So like, can, again, still experience both privilege and uh, areas of, um, of challenge, right? And, and based on um, discrimination or oppression. Along the same, line, same lines, a person could also experience being, you know, again, in the margins or um, kind of othered based on multiple aspects of their social identity. So let's say someone has darker skin color and they're a Spanish speaking immigrant and they have low literacy, right? So you think about kind of all these kind of layers of um, challenges and barriers and oppression kind of stacking up on each other. Just think about all the multiple ways that our systems, our organizations are set up, right? Are kind of designed to exclude people based on um, those different dimensions or aspects of their identities um, that our, our systems are actually built to, to make things harder. Um, so lots of different ways to think about power and privilege. I, I try to, I like to encourage 
people, I try to remind myself that again, it's not super helpful if we automatically go to, well, you're, you're bad if you have privilege, you're good if you're, <laughs> if you're, if you somehow experience um, hardship, but, but it's not helpful if, if we think in that kind of binary way, but really think about, we all have some form of power, we all have some form of privilege, so it's, it's a, more a matter of how do we use it um, for the better. And continuing along these same lines, and this is still from that fostering equity guide from the Center for Community Resilience. Um, it's a, what I really like about that guide is it actually then goes a step further and defines different types of power. So oftentimes we, when we talk about sharing power or building power in this community, we're often thinking about kind of that traditional organizational decision-making power, right? Who gets to make the final call on decisions? Um, this guide is actually recognizing that there are many different types of power that are just as valuable, at, but that sometimes get overlooked in our kind of formal systems, our usual ways of doing things. So in addition to having traditional organizational power, people might have expert power. Maybe they have particular knowledge or experience or expertise, um, whether it's because of education, whether it's because of lived experience, uh, that expert power could come from, you know, different uh, sources or different experiences. Someone might also have reward power, meaning they have the ability to um, kind of reward or encourage other people and have it mean something, whether that is through, you know, money or praise or, or recognition or, again, social connections. Um, the fact that that reward means something to others um, is a form of power. Flip side of that is someone could also have coercive power, right? That they have the ability to make someone's life harder, right? Either um, in a punitive way or there's some kind of threat of punishment, which really then makes people act a certain way. So hopefully that's clear that that's a, not a great use of power, but it's important to recognize um, that that exists. People might also have information power. Um, there's that saying, knowledge is power, right? And, and sometimes people exert their power by withholding information, right? Because then it means that, you know, people have to come to me if they want to know something. Whereas, you know, sharing that power would, would look like sharing that information, you know, openly and freely with others. Referent power, um, this is about who you know, who your connections are, who your networks are, the relationships you have. So again, there's another similar phrase about Something like it's not so much what you know, it's who you know. This is kind of what that's talking about. Then again, this could be referent, this referent power could be something that someone in an, in an organization has. It could be something that someone in the community has, right? And maybe that referent power from a community member uh, is actually even more valuable, right? Than uh, what someone in an organization holds. Then there's charismatic power, right? The power to influence others just through your personality, your ability to persuade or inspire others, or moral power, right? That people really look to someone for that ethical leadership and um, you know, kind of their values-based leadership and, and want to follow and, and support whatever they're doing. So again, lots of different types of power that are important to recognize and think about, not only what kinds of power, you know, uh, each of us as individuals have, but that um, others that we work with in the community might also have. And kind of layering that with, and this is a concept also that um, Hannah Garcia introduced in one of our earlier core conversations, I think it was last summer, kind of this idea of, of the center and the margins. So thinking about, you know, who are the people or organizations or groups in the center that tend to have the most power and privilege, especially when it comes to making decisions and decisions that impact other people's lives right, in the community. Um, so, you know, thinking about who's in the center and who tends to be in the margins, meaning they have, you know, again, they're individuals or groups that have less or the least amount of power and privilege based on things like uh, systemic oppression or structural oppression and marginalization, right? And then you might even have people that are not, not just in the margins, but they're outside or beyond the margins, right? That they are, um, that there are so many barriers, right? Structural barriers and, and systemic barriers that they're uh, not, even, not even close to the center, right? So we have to really think about like, what does that look like in real life and where do we stand? 
So I'm going to actually uh, guide us through a little thinking exercise here. We'll do a, first a, a brief kind of individual reflection exercise. And then as Nicole uh, mentioned a moment ago, have you then get, have a chance to talk about it and kind of share some of those reflections uh, in uh, just a pairs or, or group of three, uh, very small groups. And so I, um, hopefully all of you got the email I sent out earlier with the handout that just basically has these same instructions I'm gonna walk you through um, just on a, on a PDF, on a separate piece of paper so it's easier to see. I just posted those links in the chat also if anyone wants to open that up and, and follow along. Um, but basically I'm gonna ask you to just get a blank piece of paper and draw two circles like what you see on the slide. You know, one circle in the center and then a larger circle around it. So you have two concentric circles. And I want you to think about a project you're currently working on or maybe that you're about to launch. So think about something really specific that you're working on or about to do. And think about a particular issue or decision that needs to be made. It might be a program that needs to get developed or implemented or a new practice that you're trying to change um, or a policy that needs to be created or again, modified. So think about a particular issue or decision that needs to be made in that project. And just write a very brief description, like a couple words to describe it in the, in the center of your circle. And I'll just say that only you are gonna see this little map so you can, you know, write as much or as little as you want on it um, and be as specific or as vague as you want in it, only you will see it. But after you've thought of that project and a specific issue or decision, then I want you to think about where you are in relation to the, the decision-making. So draw an X somewhere on your map to show your position on this power map. Do you feel like you are like right in the center, like you are, you know, very close to making that decision, like you're, you're kind of central to making that decision? Do you feel like you're kind of straddling that line between the center and the margins where you're, you definitely need to be involved, but you're recognizing that you're, you know, you're not the decision maker? Do you feel like you're actually in the margins or, <laughs> or outside, right? So put an X to show where you think you stand. And then from that position, from where you stand, think about who are the individuals or groups that are currently in the center, meaning they are closest to the decision-making. And just use symbols or pictures or, or letters or however you wanna do it to, to mark who those people are or those groups are and where they are. Are they all kind of clustered together in the center? Or are they kind of spread out? Give you a moment to do that, think about that. And then for the next step, think about who is in or even outside of the margins, meaning they are farther from the decision-making. They might also be people or groups that kind of straddle that line um, between the center and the margins. Maybe they're closer to certain people that are in the center, so they kind of have that connection there. Or maybe they fall outside of the margins, like they really uh, aren't connected to or aren't even considered during that planning or decision-making process. There might be individuals or groups that are outside of the margin, but they themselves are closely connected, and so they can be kind of grouped together. So again, just use you know, symbols or drawings or markings to kind of map out where individuals or groups fall who are either in or outside of the margins. And then think about what types of power does each person or group have, whether they're in the center or in or outside of the margins. And you'll see on the slide that I use just some abbreviations like TO, meaning traditional organizational or REF for referent power. So Think about what types of power each person or group has and why. Why do you think they have that power? And, and so the little hint here is, or tip is, <clears throat> you know, think about how this relates to privilege, to structural oppression, things like systemic racism. <clears throat> 
think about what types of power tend to be recognized by institutions and organizations versus overlooked or kind of discounted as not as valuable. Okay, and I'm gonna scroll through the video tiles and just see, does everybody have kind of the, the beginnings of a little power map here? Okay, so for our next part, we're gonna give you a, an opportunity to take turns, just sharing your observations and your insights about your power map. So when you look at kind of what you put on your little power map or your paper, what stands out for you? And you could you know, share anything in terms of you know, what types of individuals and groups are in the center versus in or outside of the margins, what types of power they have or don't have and how that relates to patterns of privilege and structural oppression. Um, you could share how it might feel to, to you know, share power or be given additional power. So you'll have about two to three minutes each to share your insights and then think about, because when we come back, we're gonna ask everyone to share one or two key insights on a, a group Padlet, like basically a little website. So think about what are, the, what are those one or two key insights that you're gonna, gonna want to share. Okay. So Nicole Lezen is going to randomly assign everybody to a partner in a breakout. And so we encourage you to stay on for this whole discussion and come back <laughs> um, because we wanna hear and, and see what some of the key insights are. Um, and I'm going to share a link in the chat uh, for a Padlet. So Padlet, if you have never used one before, is basically a like a website um, that we're going to use as kind of like a, a whiteboard. And so you can open that up in your own screen if you want. We're going to just take a few moments to use this to capture any of the kind of insights that came up as you were doing the your individual reflection as you talked with your partner. I'll show it on my screen for a moment so that you know how to use this. Um, and uh, you can click anywhere on the screen. So double click anywhere on the screen to, to open up a new little box and type in one or two key insights from that came up for you again during that power mapping exercise. And um, if you type it in English, then we have uh, Nikki Bailey and Gisela Carrasco that are going to translate so that again, we can read and communicate in both uh, English and Spanish on this call. Um, so go ahead and, and share your insights. And then in, as you see these pop up, And take a moment to read them. Try to move them so that they're not overlapping. And then if you see one that you that really resonates with you where you think, oh yeah, that that speaks to me, or I totally agree with that. Um, you can click the heart icon to like it, to show that that's something that you agree with or that resonates with you. So I see things like shifting power can't be imposed, it has to be chosen. And that The importance of amplifying the diverse types of power within communities is important. One group saying they were all lost as far as equity and how that shows up in health and all policies. Someone else saying they have no new knowledge on health and all policies. 
that might either mean that they already knew a lot or still have a lot of questions and we can spend a moment to kind of hear more of what those questions are and maybe they can't all be answered today, but um, will be good things to follow up on. See a comment here about people are doing some of the power dynamics work, just not in a formal framework. Yep. So that's important to recognize and hold up as credible and valid as well. Someone sharing a specific example of an ordinance that um, highlights or is an example of unequal power dynamics. Uh, so I think we could probably all think of a lot of examples in our daily work in lots of different situations where that same kind of power imbalance happens. Providing a framework and concept is valuable. Application of the concept in our community was unclear. So again, that's an area that we can kind of think about how to follow up on or provide more of that clarity. And I think also, you know, it's, a, it's another uh, <clears throat> kind of opportunity or moment to think about, okay, how do we make meaning together, right? And how do we um, kind of contribute or share kind of our different uh, types of knowledge or experiences with health and all policies, with equity, with this kind of work around um, power dynamics and how do we um, kind of make meaning of it together? And knowing it's not going to be easy or, a, an, you know, <laughs> there's very rarely ever quick fixes, right? So it's the, how do we kind of um, build that shared knowledge and language together so that we can continue this work together. I'm wondering if anyone would, um, especially if some of these um, comments, you know, about feeling like still not quite certain or um, like more work or more discussion needs to happen to kind of think about how to apply frameworks like this going forward. Would anyone like to unmute themselves to extend a little bit more on their, on their thought, on their, you know, what would be helpful to hear more about or get more clarity on? Just reading through some, some more comments are still being added. One about moving away, would love to move away and forward from performative discussions. Keisha, is that a hand raise? Is that? Oh, yes. <laughs> kind of. I see you. <laughs> you know, the health and all first, you know, thank you, Tiffany and, and Martine. I can only imagine that health and all policy is just this huge dynamic framework that in three sentences or five minutes, it may be um, challenging to, to clearly capture uh, the power and the impact that this work can have. And maybe it's um, an opportunity for us to hear it in sections, you know, just the different sections. I'm just looking at, at other um, comments, you know, um, just if we could maybe dissect it and, and, and make it palatable, just dissect it in different sections moving forward. Maybe that would help us grasp, um, have a stronger grasp on what, what it is, what it looks like in action. But just being a part of um, sitting on a couple of health and all policy dis discussions and things like that, I do understand it's, it's dynamic planning. It's a huge framework to take on, which I am glad that our cities like Santa Cruz and Watsonville have adopted. Um, but maybe just again, that breaking it up in, in sections, maybe that would also help us digest and, and get some, gain some clarity on what we're 
looking at. Thanks for that, Keisha. And um, I think there's a lot of parallels too in terms of sometimes we find that with our work with core, right? There's um, like, how do you go from concept, right? Yeah. But where it can like, the concept makes sense, but then how do you, you know, what does that look like in action or what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? And so it is, that's a continuous process. How do you, how do you break it down? How do you explain it in ways that <laughs> people that aren't immersed in the work day-to-day, -day, right? Can, can understand it and, and feel and see themselves in it. Mm -hmm. If I might interject here, you know, health and all policies the framework looks different in every jurisdiction. And we spent a year evaluating what other groups did before determining the eight actions in the first year, which were health and all policies in action. So that's the training, the additional training, the equity screening workshop, the agenda report. That is how we've implemented in year one. And I think it's important to remember that we are trying, it's not that I'm doing all health and all policies, we're trying to normalize health and all policies throughout our organization. So I may not be able to address, say, the outdoor living ordinance. It is not something I work on on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's not something that I'm able to speak to. However, the staff that are working on it are subject to making sure that health and all policies is discussed in the agenda report language. Um, and ideally earlier on with some of the equity resources that we have uh, provided. So I'm happy to break it down in whatever format. There's a lot there, a critique of it is that it is um, a framework that's a rather ambiguous and amorphous and it's hard to bring it down to really tangible. And that's why we tried to kind of walk you through the steps of making equity real through this whole process and what we did in year one and what will be happening going forward. So thank you for the opportunity um, to clarify um, a little bit more. And I see Stephanie has her hand raised. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so I think for me at least, so much of how I come you know, into these spaces, I'm always wondering, is it, you know, my lack of knowledge, you know, I'm myself, I'm a parent, and I'm also a resident of downtown Santa Cruz. And so I see how health and all policies could really make, uh, make or break any experience from each level. I'm also a community leader from my own nonprofit on parenting and adult education. And so I, you know, I try and be really cognizant of, you know, how to really show up in these spaces to be um, both an ally and also just really opening to listening and receptive of these conversations. And I, I just, I have to say, I mean, an investment of time of two hours and not being able to really come away with what health and all policies look like, even in regards to our most recent city council decisions. I mean, I just, I hold the, the space for both, you know, putting trust into our elected leaders and also just, you know, wanting to move forward on conversations and see, you know, if I'm in this space, how can I bring a voice to the marginalized community? And so when I see some of these um, like power dynamic um, experiences that come up in the activities or even as like how we define some of these uh, like big key terms, it just, it, it kind of makes me a little, I don't know, I just have to really check myself as far as, you know, how am I feeling? How, like, what could this mean? And I feel, I just really needed to, to share that because again, I really hope to be an ally in this space, both for the leaders that are really pushing these decision-making policies, but also for the every parent, the every community member that ends up getting caught up in, you know, in what this means for day-to-day -day life. And so again, you know, tremendous respect for you, Tiffany and Nicole and Martine and everyone. and. Again, I just, I hope that with the power and privilege that I have as, you know, being, uh, having some education and being able to really have knowledge on, you know, these terms, but also just what does that mean when we're making these policies? What does that mean when we're not able to have a two hour conversation focused on health and all policies so that it moves away from the conceptual and really into how is it being implemented in our most recent decisions and how is this implemented moving forward? Again, I mean, we just have 
so much on us and so much on our shoulders. So I, I understand that there's no easy answer, but I think that we can take a critical lens, especially with the sheer amount of people power in this room to be able to do that. So that's my two cents. Thank you for letting me share. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I think there's, um, I, I think it's, you know, the, the feedback, the, um, uh, you know, the comments, I think it's all valuable, right, and all valid. And I think that it's a learning, you know, I, I'm not going to weigh in on the, on the, council's decisions because I think <laughs> really because we have five minutes left today and and partly because that that wasn't going to be the specific focus of today so I, I definitely hear in terms of um kind of the emotions that come up right in terms of feeling like when there's a disconnect between um kind of intent or a policy and then um, action. So I, I, I want to say that, that I hear that and I, um, and I think for all of us, like this is a learning process. And so, um, I think it's a huge step in the right direction. Like when we see things like, you know, the County has declared racism as a public health issue. The city of Santa Cruz has done that. There's a you know, equity committee, like there's all these steps, right? And people kind of trying to figure out like what this actually means and how do you put these words into action? Um, and it's, I mean, that's, I have to say, I think it's tough, right? It's a long, it's gonna be a long journey. And there are definitely gonna be areas and decisions where we may not all agree, right? On, on the process or the outcome of it. And, um, you know, I think, the, and I, I don't feel like I can really speak for the city, but I know that they're still early on in their learning process and implementation of health and all policies. And they're trying to figure out like, what does this really look like, you know, in practice. Um, and so I hope that through kind of venues like this or opportunities like this that we're building that not only shared understanding and language to be able to keep having these hard conversations, but also some of that trust and relationships so that the hard conversations don't result in like <laughs> people going back to their corners, right? Or um, feeling like, okay, well, we'll never agree or you never see them, you know, like give up hope, right? Um, and so I appreciate the the real comments, the real feedback, um, and hope that people keep showing up to these kinds of conversations, right, to, to help us figure it out. I like Keisha's comment, you know, we're on this journey together through the uncertainty while we increase trust, create space for understanding. Yeah. Are there any other comments, reflections, reactions to anything you've heard today. I'm just sharing my screen in our last couple minutes here to, to share another conversation. Um, but while I'm doing that, I want to thank everyone for leaning into discomfort and for our adhering to our brave space um, suggestions at the outset, because I think I agree with everyone who said this is, these are not easy conversations. It's easy to get frustrated with the pace and the fact that they continue to be conversations as opposed to action, but we're only gonna get there if we keep talking to each other and keep exploring these issues together. So thank you for hanging in there and, and for being honest and leaning into discomfort as, as needed. But on Thursday, March 11th, um, in the middle of the day, we're gonna continue a series that um, Nicole referred to either. In fact, some of the, the power and privilege, the types of power, those kinds of um, concepts and, 
and uh, materials came from the Center for Community Resilience, which has a model of adverse childhood experiences that talks about the, the pair of ACEs, the, the adverse childhood experiences, but also the adverse community experiences, which are environments, which are the soil in which adverse childhood experiences grow and flourish. And so we want to ask ourselves what's in our soil. And those are a lot of the questions that we've been grappling with in this conversation and so many others. So I hope that you'll join that conversation as well to dig a little deeper specifically to early childhood, but as we know, those, those issues affect everyone uh, as adults, as community members. So here's the, um, the link to, to join it and we hope to see you there. So thanks for joining us today and for all of the participation and a special shout out to our translators and interpreter who made it possible for people to participate today in Spanish as well as English. So thank you for that. And I don't think Dr. Hernandez is still with us, but the, um, the starting out with the land acknowledgement was really powerful and something to, to hold on to for subsequent meetings. So thanks everyone.